We're gonna start off with these. Yeah. What do you think about these old man glasses? The blue blockies. Those yeah. are blocking. Found these and uh, kind of remind me of like super old dude driving. I mean, like we played Wichita last Tuesday. We stopped at Love's on the way, and I got myself like a. I don't know. Pimp Kane had like a oh, yeah. golden tiger head on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. like, okay, this is my move. Trucker and I walked up on stage with my old man glasses using my cane. Yeah. I think I nailed it. That's you know, sick. It's a good vibe. That's a perfect heels deal. Yeah. I like to switch it up and uh and also just be like old man coming through. And then boom. Still got the moves. Still got them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. To a special edition. To the uh, the man is here. He's made it finally. The cruiser. So good to be here, my friend. Stevie Cruz. Um, it's hard to. I can't really pinpoint. Stevie's just a. Uh, he's Son just a, a, a bean. <laughs> you can't I'm really describe. You can't Damn, describe dude, what he is. He's just a sentient slurs. bean. He's just. I am a beaner. He's. <laughs> it's true. It's, I got it's a little, true. I got a little beaner in me. Um, no, Stevie's a DJ. A lot. Some of you might know him from DJing. Some of you know him from Hammerlord. Some of you know him from Heels. Woo. And. One thirty eight. The 138s, the Union Library. He's just this is true. Uh, lives a life filled with art. <laughs> and you I've also that? Stevie yeah, and I yeah, stood yeah. outside for the last 25 minutes Ooh. trying to pinpoint when we met, but it was we're going to spend the uh, uh, we're we're, whole we're hour yeah we're that going on out. about 2001. <laughs> so early aughts, <laughs> early aughts. Stevie would have was in his was probably just barely twenty one, <laughs> and I would have been just a just baby. under eighteen. He was just a baby, <laughs> just a baby. Um, yeah, man, I do not. I mean, it all blends together. It's um, hard to, dude. I have the same thing. Sometimes I tell stories, and I'm like, "Did that happen before the other thing?" And it's like, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it that's all what happened. I was thinking on the way here. I'm like. I, I'm going to be a mess. I mean, it all just kind of blends just and merges blends. together. And, um, but I'll do my best to, uh, I'll do my best to remember. Oh, we're just going to get just the gonna member berries and percolating and, and, and get with the But flow. it's so awesome to be on set, dude. Be here. You're finally here. I love this show. This is like Thank one you. of my favorite shows. I and, appreciate and, it. And, uh, I learned so much. There's and you're one. Doing, you're doing a great service. For all of you that said there was none, there's one. It's true. No, it's been going good. I've, I enjoy doing it because it lets me, um, it was sort of an exercise. At first, it was like it started out different, where it was like me talking to people from behind the camera. Yeah. And I was like doing it a different way. And then a friend was like, no, you need to be, let's figure out how to make it to where you're on the camera with the person. Most definitely. But then it became like an exercise of how do I listen better? And then I started like being shocked about like how much I fucking learned about people that I had known for 20 years because it's just like the weird shit you don't really talk about yeah you know what and i mean putting all the pieces together right and you especially all, for scattered brains right like ours. and then you figure it out like our, you know like, and you and yeah and everyone <laughs> you here. you know um um but we know you're from wichita well kind of kind so, of so yeah i'm originally from fresno california right and i lived there until i was about uh 13 going on 14 but i was definitely 13 when i moved to kansas and immediately got thrust in this culture shock because i moved to this like one horse town uh down way down south central kansas on the oklahoma border but on the kansas side and that's where i went to high school and when i went to first day of high school i mean i pretty much was the same as i am now um but I walked in first day of high school, you know, there's one high school, right? I graduated with ma- like less than 30 kids. Right. And so the first day of school, I walk in long hair, combat boots, had this sweet glow in the dark Ozzy Osbourne shirt where he's being crucified and there's all these little gremlins. Right. Um, the kids were just scared. Like they yeah, wouldn't they talk to me. They thought they, they literally thought I was the devil. Um, and I was like, Oh shit, this is, this is 
this is going to be hard. Like I hate it. Yeah. Uh, and I did, I fucking totally hated it. Um, but there's a lot of like, uh, old crazy people that, um, eventually were my friends and right. learned about country cruising and, uh, Remember these dudes, you know, these 20, 30 year old guys and gals I'd hang out with. And they were like, they were a trip, man. They were like listening to Skinner and the ghetto boys. Right. You know what I mean? It was just this weird time. So that would have been, I guess, late, mid, late 90s. I, no, I guess that would have been early 90s. That would have been like the early in 90s. mid 90s. So I graduated in 96. Right. I do remember that. And the day I graduated, I hightailed it to Wichita. But all during high school. So. Anyways, this town was was what that was. Um, but I had family in Wichita, and Wichita was the closest big city. Um, that was how more, far are you talking? How many? About, a, like, about an hour. Oh, that's not a bad drive. drive. Yeah, because okay. Wichita is pretty far south. Right. Um, yeah, and I was already playing clubs and bars when I was. Uh, so yeah, uh, me and Marshall Kilpatrick, who went on to be the drummer of the esoteric as well as a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you know, great, great friend. One of my best friends, we started a band in high school in based out of Wichita. Uh, even though I was living, uh, not in Wichita, but a- any vacation I had, I was in Wichita, like staying with my uncle and my grandma, whoever I could just to be in the city. And we started, and then, then I got to the point where I was like, playing show my parents were like you can't do that and i'm like you you can't tell me what to do like yeah. <laughs> you know what you i mean like you move me in the middle of nowhere and you're lucky i just don't run away or you know go ham and you know like i'm gonna do like this is what i want to do so uh, here here is here's my thing when i before i left fresno first show i went to see so i was like 12 or 13 right around right around there i saw slayer and testament uh, Seasons of the Abyss tour and Testament was on the Souls of Black tour. My mom made my uncle go with me. My dad was like, didn't know about it because even though my dad was cool as shit, he would not have okayed that. me being that young going to see Slayer. And uh, so my uncle Moochie took me to see my first metal show, Slayer Testament. It was awesome. A um, few months later, Wanted to go see Pantera was coming through uh, on the Cowboys from Hell tour with Wrathchild America opening and the Crucified, who were also who were from Fresno, I believe. And I don't know if you remember, what was it the Cowboys from Hell video? It was just the live video, yeah. and Phil still has the Mohawk, and he's like pulling kids up on stage, and everybody's stage diving. Like that literally happened to me. Like I was like. Whoa, fucking Pantera. Oh, this is awesome. And then Phil just like grabbed me, pulled me up on stage, gave me a high five, threw me off the stage. State my first stage dive. I just had a blast. They they just wrecked it and it was amazing. And as soon as I got done, I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be that guy. I want to do this. I want to make kids feel like like how I was feeling. And I want to feel how I imagine that guy's feeling. And that <clears throat> was definitely the reason the first real reason why i was like i gotta do something like that and it was not too long after that concert some crazy family stuff happened and we had to get out of dodge and move yeah. to the middle of nowhere and right. uh, but yeah so i started playing shows and once i got a taste of that and actually did a show you know with your friends and you're you know playing heavy metal out loud and there's you know other kids like getting into it I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm not going to do this. And my parents were like, okay, we, you know, as long as you keep your grades up and stay in school, you could do whatever you want. And I was like, Psh, no problem. Like, yeah, cause it was done. like a small town. Like it, it wasn't was, hard to do it good w- in school when there's only yeah, 30 people. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, it wasn't, no, I'm no, I'm no brainiac, but I mean, it was, you know, it, you got a lot the, of teacher attention. I imagine super, when you're uh, yeah. academic, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just kind of fill in the blank type of stuff. So what? Well, I, get, I think back then they probably also knew like we're not breeding. Like there was probably one kid who was like super, super smart. And then everybody else, it's like, Larry's probably going to be a farmer like his dad. And Jimmy's <laughs> going to go work at that fucking plant up the street. Cause right? that's what you do in weird towns like that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It was, it was a trip. I mean, I was playing football, um, before I moved to Kansas, like, uh, you know, pop Warner, but like, you know, full on 
you know, pads hitting, you know, the whole nine probably shouldn't have been playing at that age. Cause, but that's, you know, so I was, even though I was like really into metal and, and rock and roll and, you know, and, and gangster rap, like, you know, right. all those two, two live crew, NWA, you know, DOC, like, was it always heavy boys. metal for you? Like yeah. that's how it all started. Like yeah. you weren't a punk rock guy. No, I was more... into, ra- I was into my first, well, I mean, you know, as a young person, as a, a little kid, little kid, you know, the, like, so I, like was the beginning of MTV. So right. like the first thing I saw that blew my mind was, you know, Van Halen or like, or David Lee Roth right. specifically. So I don't know if that would have been right when Skyscraper came out or whatever. But I, anyways, like I remember being really young and seeing David Lee Roth. And at the time I was like super into, you know, uh, WWF wrestling like infatuated, uh, you know, as a little kid. And then I an MTV came on and I was watching whatever videos were, were happening. But when David Lee Roth was up there, I was like, holy shit, dude. It's like, it's like a wrestler dude, but he's also like a rock and roll dude. And he's like having a blast and chicks dig him. And he's like the coolest, toughest guy. And I remember as soon as I like saw him, I started uh, acting like I was sick. So I didn't have to go to school and I'd have the house to myself. And then I would, once everybody left, I would like make stage monitors and I would like get my own David Lee Roth outfit. It was like cross between like David Lee Roth. And I don't, you know, whatever wrestler I was like obsessed with at that time. And then I would like have my own concerts to myself while everybody was gone. That would have been my, probably my first performances. Just nice. remembered that. So thank yeah. you. And uh, but wrestling started early too. Oh yeah, that was that my was first. To me, same with my me. first love. I my grandpa had a friend that like you know he knew a guy. You know my grandpa knew a lot of. He grew up around here, like in the that would have been like the fifties, I guess forties, fifties. Right. But he had a buddy that was, I mean you know he sold us a D scrambler for the. Satellite. My grandpa had this satellite dish that used to move. You know what I mean? Oh, like high tech. Yeah, it like went to like different generations. It was like very early satellite dish stuff. But he only bought that because his buddy had a thing where he could unlock all the channels for free. You know what I mean? Like we, I grew up. My parents filed bankruptcy twice. Like we were not in the best of shape financially, but. We had this deal, and it enabled us to get every channel available in the world, basically, right? So you would find weird – you just go channel scrolling, and, like, there was, like, weird channels that only showed NWA wrestling all the time. Damn. Right? It was See, like they were just playing a feed yeah. from, like, some station that – you'd only pick it up if you had a dish. I, yeah. But I, then there it would be like – I could pick up – Local television from any city in America, you could get all their channels, but we got every fucking pay per view for free. So, from the Whoa, time dude. I was like very young up and through most of high school, yeah, I watched every single WWF pay per view, those were the best. And then we during the Monday Night Wars, dude, like, well, that's way later, right? Well, yeah, well, it would have been. Right, it would have been like middle school for me. Okay, yeah. But like during yeah, all yeah. that, like that was it was hot to trot, dude. Young like man, I remember. Fuck, dude, I remember. Like we'd have like there'd be thirty people at my parents' house. Oh yeah, like adults, kids, every like we were making. Yeah, everybody I was pretty, was we were it. making signs. You know what I mean? Nice. Well, that's crazy though. You had uh, NWA, like so that was a thing. Right. So I don't really. I mean, I understand the modern product and right. And by modern, I even still consider like the Attitude Era, like modern, modern the beginning right, right, of right. modern. You know, because it was so after the territory old school. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, so my intro was like eighties. WWF, you know, like the beginning of Hulkamania and, right. uh, and I didn't know about any other wrestling. Like, right. so for a long time, I didn't know about, you know, Ric Flair, NWA, uh, world class or, or, or anything but WWF. Cause that's just what was on the TV. Um, so it wasn't until later when I like started getting those channels that I saw, real wrestling right you know what i mean but as a kid when i first saw that like my i was immediately kind of like 
I was turned off, but obviously like still intrigued. I was like, oh, it's funny because like, I'm, I'm like, oh man, those guys, those guys look like too real. Like that's not that's not wrestling. Like that's mm -hmm. just real dudes. Like that's just two drunk guys like mm -hmm. getting in a fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I didn't appreciate. No the one's dressed like a clown, dude. Right, like, right. What's the you know, deal? I mean, I was, I was a kid, so of course I wanted like cartoon characters, and that's right. what uh, the and WWE, WWE, WWE knew that, provided. Right? Like, they that. were like yeah, basically that's what creating it was. like cartoon characters right. and superheroes. But so yeah, and then then David Lee Roth was like what drew me in and made that rock and wrestling connection. You know, he was doing those high kicks and right. the the outfits and the whole like cock of the walk attitude was just like mind blowing to me and. Yeah, like his voice is, you know, you could say, oh, that dude can't sing or whatever. And I, I didn't really process it at that time. But at that time, I was like, man, that guy sounds like himself. You know what yeah. I mean? He doesn't sound like he's trying to sing or, he, or he's trying to – It just he just sounds like he's not trying. He sounds like he's just being himself. And that right. was, like, super inspiring to me. Um, but then, uh, yeah, going – into uh back where yeah hanging out in wichita as a teenager um playing in uh this band me and marshall had this band called noisem groove and uh no bigs we just created rap rock okay right. yeah so no one <laughs> small small fact that uh no one really knows that uh, me and my boys created rap rock in uh the night mid 90s in wichita kansas wow so that's i you believe know, that sorry and thank you you're welcome. <laughs> you know I, mean? I think you're welcome is basically what you should be telling people. You're welcome, right? We, uh, so yeah, we were, I was playing, I would like be playing at a bar till, you know, two in the morning and hauling ass back to this, uh, podunk town and waking up and going to school, like still like tripping acid or half drunk and or whatever and still making good grades and not getting in any trouble that my parents knew about. So I just rolled like that all the way until, they wouldn't let me leave the house until I graduated high school. And so I fulfilled my promises. And the day I graduated, I... You were going to Wichita. Oh, yeah. And we yeah. had a big band house and just kept the uh, dream alive and kept going. And um, there is... So Wichita... There is a band from Wichita called Dead Orchestra that y'all got to check out. They're amazing, if you haven't heard of them. Uh death metal hybrid that's just kansas as fuck yeah oh yeah that was the thing that drew me in that inspired me because i really was having a bad time uh in this small town and um i was like what am i gonna do and then i heard about you know started you know hanging out with these older guys somehow found out there was this dude named justin crumbless that used to live in this town where i lived and he was a big heavy metal singer in this band called dead orchestra and they're like touring europe and putting out records and stuff and i'm like whoa dude if this guy can come from this place and do this then i can right and then and i started doing it and then lo and behold a little bit down the road like we met and uh when he learned about who i was and where i was from he kind of took me under his wing and then he introduced me to his manager this this famous infamous dude uh of wichita named ronnie true you ever heard of Ronnie True? Uh-uh. Dude. Legend. So he was the manager of Dead Orchestra, as well as a uh, manager of many other things. Right. And um, that's how I met Jeff Fortier. Okay. Because we are talking about Jeff. So yeah. Because I think Jeff Fortier is our link. That's our link, right? right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, definitely. Jeff is my link. <laughs> Working for Jeff was my... I grew up in Bonner Springs. Okay. So as a kid... I had no idea, like, we didn't, even once we got cars, we didn't come to the city um, at first. Like, I didn't know anything about it. My sister was a sharp skinhead and got kicked out of school, left the house, lived in Lawrence. with. So she lived in a skinhead house out there with a bunch of skins and punks. So I was at 15 years old. I didn't hang out with kids I went to school with. I didn't hang, right. I, never, I, I, I think I went to one high school party in my entire existence, but at 15... Like you, I was hanging out with people in their 20s all and the 30s old cats. in the Lawrence. Old cats. Yeah. <laughs> like hanging around all these punk rockers yeah. and, and sharp skins yeah. and skateboarders. And that was when, like, you know, punk was like ruling the world at that time, too. You know? Right. I mean, the, I remember when the Dropkick Murphys first record came out and like 
that was like a huge deal. And then here came like, it was like a whirlwind of music, you know? I didn't know that local bands existed. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know bands put out records that were like independent. <laughs> I, it, this is all things I learned. Yeah. And then one summer, my sister's old man was working for Jeff as a stagehand. And I had gone, I had went to go see, Jeff got me tickets to see the Blink-182 played at Kemper on the Damn It Tour. And I didn't give a fuck about that. What I cared about was Bad Religion was opening. So me and my sister went to that. It was full of the worst people. I'm sure. I mean, this is a time where like you were getting called a faggot for being a punk rocker. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So like imagine being in a room in 1997, 1998 of all the people that hate you going to see a punk show, essentially, right? Like, oh, yeah. And so... Uh, we're there, and there's like maybe five other people that you would be like, "Hey, that guy probably gets me." You know what I mean? And we got into like five fist fights. We, oh, yeah. I saw Bad Religion, Hell which yeah. was fucking awesome, uh, to see them at Kemper. But it was the weirdest show. It was uh, Phoenix TX, that Christian punk band, Bad Religion, and then Blink One Eighty Two. I watched like five seconds of Blink One Eighty Two, and then we left. I just got tired of the bullshit. Mm -hmm. But we went to River Market right afterwards because her old man was working. Um, George Clinton and Aha! the P-Funk were playing at River Market. Hell yeah. And this is like, again, we go there and this is the time when George Clinton, we said hi to him. He barked like a dog and then like licked my sister's hand and never said a <laughs> word and just went on stage. We're like, what the fuck? But that's where I met Jeff that day. I had never met him before. And he's like, hey, your sister said that you're like in school for the summer coming up. Do you want a job? And I was like, yeah, I'll take a job. And so I, I spent a a summer and into the next school year for a good quite a bit of time working wow. working for Jeff. Yeah. And like that dude, like all the skinhead dudes hated him back then because he used to be a, a sharp skin and then he got the dreadlocks and then like Well he always had the dreadlocks. Right. Until he did it. Right. As far it, as I knew. Well, like way, way back in the day, he was like Phew. Oh, yeah. Mr. Boots and Braces, I guess. Well, yeah. I mean, he always had those. Early, I early mean, on. Yeah. yeah. But I always <laughs> liked Jeff. He would take me to his house. Oh, man. Like, that dude treated me as for, as an employee would go. Like, I definitely got different treatment than the older people. Like, he was, like, teaching me things. Yeah. If Jeff sees something. Jeff's a, Jeff's a great guy. Yeah. I mean, if he sees something in you, he, he will take the time yeah. to, you know, dig in and, and uh, you know, take you under his wing and... And, uh, you know, help, help you out. Like, um, Oh dude, he took me to his house and would just play, show me records and be like, Hey, those don't listen to these idiots. Like they don't right. know about music. Like I will teach you about music. He fucking beat up six people. I went to high school with once. Oh yeah. At Je Tattoo the yeah, earth yeah, tour. Yeah. You were the first no, one. Jeff's a bad motherfucker. Some kid fucking threw something at me when I was on a golf cart with him. And that was like all the kids that hate all the metal heads were there. And the, the metalheads didn't like the punk rockers in oh, 1999. Yeah. And Jeff just stopped the golf cart and was like, do you fucking know those people? I was like, they go to my high school. And he just beat the shit out of all of them. Got back on the golf cart and we drove off. I was like, what the hell Gangster. just happened, dude? <laughs> yeah, so like Jeff was feeding Ronnie True shows okay. in, Wichita. in Wichita. So he right. had stuff going on at... Uh, we always played the Rock Island. That's also got some crazy stories. I mean, that's where I really cut my teeth and grew up. And if you, anyone knows about the Rock Island during that time, I mean, it, it was insane. Like, yeah. I mean, I think it eventually got busted and there is like, uh, you know, like the little games at the end of the bar with the naked Oh, yeah, 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 like, yeah. Like, a little legal gambling. with kilos. Like it was a, an yeah. operation of sorts. Um, but I mean, dude, the shows, I mean, it was endless. And that's where I got to play with. I mean, so first show I get to see is Testament Slayer. I don't know however many years later, you know, within five years, I guess, or something. My band, me and Marshall, our band's opening up for Testament at the Rock Island. So it's just like, whoa, dude, this is you know, this is where I belong. This is what I want to do. So yeah, Ronnie, Jeff did a lot for me, but obviously he wasn't always around, but he would feed these shows to Ronnie as well as, you know, whatever it all, you know, whatever they all did. But uh, we got to play a lot of shows and just be around amazing talent and crazy ass motherfuckers at such a pivotal age that, I mean, we really learned a lot about 
uh, music, but just life in general. Um, and then right. we started doing like bigger all age shows at the uh, this bingo hall. I forget what it, we just called it the bingo hall. And uh, then that's where I met uh, Bill Pyle because okay. Bill was you know, right under Jeff, like his first in command. Right. And so he was, would send Bill down to do a lot of these shows. And yeah. So when I wasn't playing the shows, you know, I would be stagehand, stagehand work, working right. the shows. And so that's how I started to meet a lot of cats from, uh, Lawrence and Kansas city. And that's why I was asking you earlier. I was like, did we meet in Wichita? Like, yeah, no, uh, I never went to Wichita. I went to Des Moines a few times. Okay. Yeah. It was and they, I went to Topeka. I okay. used to go to, uh, was that Remington's in Topeka that was there back mm. in the day? I remember we we worked Kenny Wayne Shepherd. That was pretty crazy. During the blue oh, on black. Kenny Wayne. Kenny Wayne. Yeah, man. During the on the blue when the blue on black was came out. That's when that that stupid song he had. Yeah, my uh drummer so Marshall, he played in his dad's band during the time that we were doing our band, and they were like a huge bar band like blues classic rock yeah and uh i think they opened up for kenny wayne shepherd but the coolest show i saw in wichita that they opened they got to open up for the nuge oh um, sick so Dude, I, I fucking uh, love the new yeah, I, that that's something that comes up a lot and i know a lot of people don't like that dude but i love that guy oh, so dude, much no 100 percent, man i mean i love his records i mean i mean I, dude i love him the character and i know, love that yeah i love the character I, too. the whole, it's the whole great. nine i'm i'm into it you know it's not like if he's I don't exactly know. the guy I would imagine that saying all those songs about hunting and fishing in the seventies well, would turn into. Somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, I, don't, I don't know where it is, but from that day was the month that his issue number one came out of his hunting magazine. Nice. And so he had like a million copies there, and I have the issue number one. And he signed it. Sick. Um, Somewhere, yeah, he apparently has some like really good friends here and like plays these like weird private show here every year. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, he, yeah, Nuge the Nuge, man. I mean, those are uh undeniable riffage and solos and swagger. I mean, yeah, I got to see I'm them down. a couple times. I got to see him a couple times. That was so. the only time, wouldn't mind seeing him again if he's uh, I saw him when he like reunited with the other guy for like a summer. From uh, the, Derek uh, St. The Amboy James. Dukes? Uh, no, no, no. The guy that was originally with him. The oh, dude that during sang. the Ted Nugent yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During okay. the, the first two records. Derek St. James, I think his name okay. is. Okay. But I saw him when he like played shows with him again. Cool. Dude, Nugent and Skinner, that's what I grew up on Hell as a yeah, small dude. kid. Yeah, same. I mean, well, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but Skinner is like, yeah. to this day, I still don't know if there's a better... Like and my dad was pretty into that stuff, and roll my, but my dad was a blues and jazz guy. Okay. Like, I mean, he was into everything. He was like a, you know, that's probably where I get it, where I'm just like in, have all these different interests, like musically, right. is my dad was like a record collector and he was making, I mean, he wasn't really a DJ, but he really was. Cause all he did, at least what I saw as a little kid, <laughs> he was doing a lot more than I imagined, but he was always just hanging out with his buddies, playing records, making them mixtapes. Right. And like always had these like rare, uh, rare records that he would, you know, make people copies of and stuff. And, um, yeah, so I was like definitely raised on blues and jazz, but he always had some, you know, kind of classic rock stuff happening and whatnot. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, Whenever Poison's Look What the Cat Dragged In came out, I had it on cassette tape. Yeah. And I was like, look at this, Dad. And he took one look at That's where they're like super glam. They look like chicks. And he was just, he looked at that and he just looked at me so disappointed. And yeah. he was like, what the what, fuck what is the, this, what son? What is this shit? He's like... He's like, I, I, he's like, I don't know about this, man. He's like, what else you got? And I, I think at the time, I think I had a... <clears throat> Cause I, he put it in. He's like, "All right, let me hear what it hear. Let me let me hear what it sounds like." And he he was definitely like pissed by the way they looked. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was like, even but my dad wasn't like he was such an open, sweet guy. But that for, pissed him off. Then I put in a uh, appetite for destruction, and he was like, "Okay, all right, yeah, okay, all right, yeah." Th this band's much better. He's like, "All right, you dig this? You think this is cool?" And then he just started like going through his records and putting on Led Zeppelin and. Fuck, like all kinds of stuff. He's like, see, son, it's all the same stuff, but like, you know, some people get it and some people don't. And uh, 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was really into uh, all kinds of crap. Just music. Music, yeah. dude, nonstop. Like just crazy music all the time. And then like on my mom's side of the family, it's like all Latin music. So there was like, you know, mariachi, cumbia, like... And my dad was my dad was really like Tejano stuff. Like I mean, we would have giant parties at our house. My dad built a um, a house for my grandma and grandpa, my mom's gr- mother and father, and they lived in, in our backyard. And, right. And we would just have these big parties, and so the the music was just like various, you right? Know? But it was all good. So I've always had like tons of uh, different sounds like happening. All at the same time, all the time, like my whole life. What, what f- led you to leave Wichita and move to Lawrence? Mm. That's a pretty good segue. Um, so, uh, I mean, you're playing shows. Well, yeah, you're long story short, yeah, we're doing good. This is what I want to do. And then uh, as the years go by, I had this band. I had a couple different bands with some other friends. And, um, what are you doing for work when you're down there? Are you everything? Just whatever. Uh, you dude, can. Well, yeah. so, um, I know this is a car show as well. So, yeah. uh, I, um, I come from a line of body men. Okay. You know, not, uh, That's my trade. yeah, no guts. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, it's all like, you know, body work. So, um, all my uncles, my grandpa, um, so I worked in body shops, detailing and starting to learn, you know, I had yeah. to buff stuff out and fill, you know, fill dents and whatnot. Um, uh, did a, so I worked at a couple body shops earlier on. I mean, I've done everything. Worked you at, were doing the show. Worked at a record store. Well, I mean, right. I was, I was doing stagehand work, right. but I, I worked at a, I mean, I went even, I mean, I started roofing houses. Also, when uh, I was 16, that's just in like, you know what I mean? Blood really. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, and my dad too. Yeah. So my dad's the white guy, uh, you know, in my mix, but, uh, is he, he a roofer? Uh, he wasn't a ro- I mean, he, 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 he roofed roof his fair, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. but he was a, you know, he was in a uh, carpentry okay. and, and construction. So yeah. Um, any kind, all kinds of jobs. Like I worked at, uh, in Wichita, I worked at yesterday's disc, um, which is, which is a record store. Um, so nothing, nothing really, everything was still music. Music was the well, main yeah, goal. But I totally had, I mean, I, yeah, but you were making, I that's what I mean. There was no thing that grabbed you. That was like, Oh, I only, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I had to, you didn't I, have a I career learned, while you were doing music. No, I learned you right just, away that yeah. you had to work a real job if you wanted to be a rocker or right. an artist or whatever. You had to do something to support that. You know, that's right. <laughs> thank God I learned that at an early age. And but you nothing know. sucked you into where it's like, oh, this is just what oh, I no, do. Man. And I was rock like and always had the, the dream side. in right. my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like super into it. I mean I, so yeah, I was painting house. I think I was before I left, I was doing a lot of painting because I had this pretty cush painting job for this company that owned like a bunch of a car apartment complexes. Oh, sick. Just and so like, it was like paint. Yeah. yeah it's super, super easy. Make readies, yeah. make readies for apartments. Um, but yeah, I was playing in a band and I was, uh, I, so I lost my dad around that time. Um, no, 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 no. I was already, yeah, no, I was okay. So I'm in, in which in Wichita and I lost my dad and that just, Till, you know, you never get over it. Right. Um, but he's like, you know, one of my best friends and he's, he's my dad. So, right. Um, and you're pretty young for that to be. Yeah. You're like, thank God I had what, the like time almost that 21, I did, right? Like somewhere you're around ragged, there, yeah. between 18 it's, and 21, right? Yeah. Like, that time for me a, is you're so not quite an adult, but not quite a teenager. That like, I you're, can't you're, remember. Yeah, like, like, I still, often think, which I probably have, I, I, I uh, find myself thinking, have I outlived? my father, you know, like what, Mm. but, but, and I probably have, but maybe not. Right. But I I don't know because, so that's where it like gets real blank. Cause it was just super kind of a traumatic. But you'd be, if you have it, you're probably close to. Yeah. Right. So I think about that a lot lately as I'm, uh, you know, just getting younger over here. But yeah, I, um, lost my dad and then there was, I was in the, this band and I was really madly in love with, um, this gal that, I was playing music with and, you know, living that dream. And we broke up and just the combo of those things just 
I, I spun out. That's like, just a I nuclear did. bomb way Oh, to yeah. Go it was, I mean, yeah. and I just was like, you know, like dark siding, like hard. Um, and we had this band and <laughs> we had some music out. And I remember like one of our friends was playing one of our songs on KJHK. And I was like, that's fucking cool. They get it in Lawrence. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was like a big deal. Yeah. It's like, dude, they played us on the radio in Lawrence. Like, yeah. I'm going to go there. But well, in that time in the nineties, that was huge. Well, right. And I just had to get out cause everything yeah. reminded me of this or that. And I was just, but like, you had a lot of friends in Lawrence already. Well, so right? yeah. Uh, me and my buddy, uh, Torin was a huge influence on me musically and, and friendship wise. We had this house and we had these bands and, this connection and we had this basement where we started having where we would do our stuff, but we also started having shows, basement right. shows. And one of those shows, the esoteric came and played our basement and just annihilated it. Right. This is the, Oh shoot. I guess this would have been the second. So the esoteric has always been Anthony, Corey, and Eric. Right. The three string players. And I would be the th- tech. Now, I'm talking technically. Like they started in high school. But right. I, I count it like as canon. I'm the third vocalist. Right. Marshall would be the third drummer. Okay. So um, rewind just slightly during that time, just because I am a huge esoteric fan. And one of the main reasons is... The first time I went to see them, I went to Lawrence. I was living in Wichita. I went to Lawrence, and they opened up for Neurosis, and it was the original version of the Esoteric, or at least that I know. And it was Michael Blue on vocals and Tony sitting up on drums. And that's my favorite version. There will never, like, I love all the versions of the Esoteric, you know, but, like, that was the cream you know, it was just unbelievable. There's a, you know, there's a seven inch and, um, the stuff that you could find with Michael blue and Tony sitting up is just, I don't know. There's something about it. So I went and saw them. They've slayed our buddy, Andy, uh, Michael ended up leaving, went to work for like the FBI, Whoa. um, which was crazy. And that just made it more cool and but more of a mystique, you know? Right. And our other buddy, Andy, um, he, Andy uh, started singing for them. Uh, I believe Tony was... Okay, so yeah, then Andy was singing for him, and Tony, I believe, was still the drummer. Maybe Adam was the drummer then? I can't remember. But I know Andy was singing. And anyways, they came and played our basement, and I fell in love with those guys. Like, they, you know, they slayed, but they're just cool guys like so fun right um so anyways yeah so then all this shit went down and um i'm like okay i know the esoteric guys and they're playing our band on kjhk that's where we need to be so uh torn and i i started getting rid of you know giving away all my worldly possessions and went down this crazy trip like we're just gonna live in a van and we're just gonna go there and play music and you know live this you know this fairy tale or whatever. And so, yeah, we went to Lawrence and pretty much did that. Went and knocked on the door. And like uh, Eric, one of my best friends, uh, Eric Graves from the Esoteric, like, or no, I think it was Dean, uh, Mean Dean, the Metal Machine, who was basically in the band, but more of a role as a manager and mentor and confidant. Uh, shout out, Mean Dean. Uh, shout out, all you dudes. Yeah. Love you guys. But uh, yeah, Dean answered the door. And I remember him being like, what the fuck? And then I remember seeing Eric, and then Eric used to have this like crazy bong. What do we call it? Like triple helix or something. And it was like, hey, dude, you want to do some bong rips? And I was like, we're home, baby. Yeah. You know, like let's smoke pot and listen to crazy music and tell tell. And Lawrence tales. was a wild like. And those guys were a on wild their- artistic place. Then. Yeah, it was like way different than it is so, now. So yeah, and then um, it was homeless for quite some time, kind of living out of the van. Then I lived in this vacant house and a hole in the basement I remember my buddy brian brian oss also a great dude uh because i man i was still having a pretty hard time i was yeah. definitely um 
Yeah. So it was, you know, it was, but it was beautiful, fun, wild, depressing, you know, learn to, you know, sink or swim right, and do something. But I was, I started really obsessing about the esoteric, um, just <clears throat> fell in love with them just as people. But then I was like, you know, and I love Andy big time. Uh, yeah. At some point, Adam Mitchell became the drummer. Um, and that really took it to a whole other level because he's on his own own thing even when he was that young um and uh i would just sit outside their jam room door and if i didn't hear their singer i'd like knock on the door like oh andy didn't show up they're like nope what do you want i'm like well i mean you know i know the songs like nah, nah. Like, stop, because I just kept doing it. Yeah. I just, you know, I mean, we would hang out, but then I would always be there when they were practicing. And Andy started getting like a big boy job and other responsibilities. That right. He had a kid. And I, you know, I'm like, bro, I don't got, I ain't got no, I mean, I, I probably had some, you know, I was working at a gas station. I was taking care of mentally ill people. I, I, I was actually, I was uh, working my ass off because I was blowing like three to $500 sometimes a week but at least a month on records at Love Garden. Right. I was just obsessed. Like once I got my legs about me and pulled out, like I was just working and just obsessively building the collection. Yeah. Buying music, listening to music, ordering records. So, um, anyways, that's a whole other deal. Uh, but yeah, I would just sit outside their jam room and be like, Hey, I know all these songs, like just saying. And then I think eventually they're just like, fuck, they didn't believe me. You know, they're like, okay, dude, go and then they started it up and i was like wow and they're like oh fuck and then they started seeing the writing on the wall like man andy because andy was like super dad you know he was a good dude and took really good care of these boys because they're fucking wild you know and yeah didn't have shit you know not like he did he had the van he had you know structure um and then so it's like, okay, how do we work you in? Okay, you're gonna be the backup vocalist and we'll get you like you could do like samples and like keyboard shit, you know. There was all as we called it in that time, you know, the there's a lot of like Spock rock, romulation is what we yeah, call it. Yeah, it'd be like it, you know, the white uh, heavy belt. metal version of like the bongo at, player. At a white belt, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm like, cool, I'll get a white belt, dude, I'll get a fucking sampler, let's go, you know, like and that so there was a version of Esoteric with Andy singing, me on backups and crazy electronics for a short amount of time before uh, Andy had to like kind of bow out and like, you know, be an adult. And the rest of us were like, all right, cool. And then I got to become their singer and I was just like, let's go, you know? Um, And then just kept grinding. Um, And then eventually, so Adam Mitchell was our drummer at that time. But he was like super young. Like, I think when we started touring, his parents had to sign like a, a, a thing because he, he was a minor. Yeah, you know, it's like like we're kidnapping a minor. You know yeah. what I mean? Even though we were all pretty young, like he was like not eighteen. Right. Uh, so and that was really overwhelming. I think to him to hang out and to, you know travel, play shows and whatnot. And eventually he quit the band or something. Yeah, that's right. We we're getting ready to do a heavy tour. And he quit the band like like a week or two before a giant tour that we already, you know, and it's self-finance. We're not right. signed or anything. We're doing it all ourselves. Yeah. And uh, I'd always kept in touch with Marshall. And we we're like, this it? We're, it's over, dude. Like, everybody's bumming. Like, tour starts. Like, oh, man. I was like, I know a guy. And they're like, who the fuck do you know that's going to come in and, and do, be able to play these and drum do parts? This. And I was like, give me the, you know, give me the phone. I think this is probably pre-cell phones, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't it's know. It's probably the it's beginning of cell phones. Right. But anyways, I came, because I knew Mar- oh, Marshall, I think, was playing in Kailesa maybe around that time, but had a falling out. Or he was playing with s- someone, kind of, kind of a big deal. And, uh, but I knew he was free and, you know, we're road. But was he still in Wichita? No, he was he, in Denver. He, he was in Denver. He was okay. in Denver. And I called him and I said, and this is, you know, cause we're like best buds. Like yeah. we had already done the whole Wichita trip. Right. So we like, we're ride or die. So I just said, yo dude, fucking, you know, I told him I'm doing this esoteric thing. You're a free bird. We got this tour coming up. <clears throat> Basically. Uh, so I, I, so yeah, I guess we emailed him. 
music or something. I'm like, I, somehow I was like, I'm sending you the songs and we're getting in the van right now and we're coming to pick you up. Cause he was like, dude, I'm down. And I'm like, boom, here, like check your shit. Here's the music, you know, eight, nine hours. We'll be there. And then drove there, put him in the van, got back, grinded for a couple of days and went on tour and just, it was like a whole new version of the band um, and just destroyed. And then we were like, this is it, dude. Cause now we are like all guns firing and um, just kept grinding. I think we had um, maybe around that time we had the infamous 1336 demo. And then, um, uh, oh God, my bad. Uh, what's the uh, homie from Leftover Crack? Uh, oh, Brad. Yeah. Shout out Brad. Uh, Brad was cool enough to put out this demo of ours, which, you know, really helped. And we were just grinding, doing all our own tours and promo and stuff. And then uh, somehow, uh, oh, you know, uh, so Esoteric had a history with, um, well, they, you know, became Lamb of God, but before that, they're called Burn the Priest. Right. And they were homies. Mastodon were homies, bef- you know, like right. uh, early esoteric shows with Mastodon right after fucking uh, Steve left them <laughs> to fend for themselves. Like, you know, it was Braun and, uh, um, sorry, my brain's old and scrambled, but yeah. the, the main dudes yeah, like, I know who you're talking that about. we're in today is the day. Yeah. Um, like right after Steve left them in Europe and they finally got back, that was like one of their first tours as Macedon was with the esoteric. So we had some heavy hitters like that believed in us and knew that we weren't fucking around. Right. And they shared our shit. I think maybe burn the priest or lamb of God by then were already on prosthetic, but they got a hold of EJ and prosthetic records. And then, are like, dude, these guys are, these kids are for real. Like you got to fucking hook them up. And so we got signed to prosthetic and then, um, recorded with the sureness of sleepwalking. I don't know when, I mean, 2004, I know it came out in 2005. Right. And then our house burned down right. Like when we sent the masters off and we had this like whole year of touring booked cause we finally had a booking agent and all that jazz. Or maybe we're still booking our own shit. But anyways, it was like, so did, got signed to Prosthetic, put out with the sureness of sleepwalking in 2005. And that, I do remember that year. And that year we played like, I don't know, close to 300 shows, you know, at least yeah. like 250, 280 shows that year. And it was because we had no home. So there right. was another thing that happened, like our house burnt down. Like we lost everything. So and, you might as uh, well just be on the road. Yeah. Or like, well. Records coming out. Let's go. Yeah, we got a record coming out. This is a sign. You know, make money to buy another house. Yeah. yeah, So we just. Well, we didn't own the house. Right. We rented the house. But yeah. uh, yeah, So then we just toured our asses off and just went into that life. I mean, and that was just the funnest year ever. I mean, we got to play with you know all the homies, dude. We did a lot of time with Himza and Every Time I Die and um, Scarlet. Fuck, dude. I mean, it was. I mean, we got to do New England Metal Fest with Mashuga. Nice. I mean, just crazy shit, you know? Like, dreamy. Like, I think right. we played that first show when Dillinger Escape Plan. I mean, we're already homies with Dillinger, but when they got the, the fucking guy, I don't know. I'm, I'm a Dimitri guy, personally, but yeah. um, the guy that's all famous, Greg. Oh, yeah. I think yeah, we played, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, maybe one of his first shows at some other festival. Um, we just, you know, we just grinded it out. Like it was just the best shit ever. And we had a blast. And, uh, then towards the end of that year, prosthetic was like, Hey, you guys need to come home and re- pretty much write, record and put out another record and get back out right away. And we're like, what? Like, cause I mean, our first record was years of years in the making kind of, right. you know what I mean? And, and all we were doing was just every day waking up and playing a show and we weren't even like right you know we have any time to like hang out and like write new stuff and then it was like no now it's like a job that you're not getting paid for because it's not like you know there's no money there's right. just money to keep it going and uh so we went home and wrote and recorded subverter like i don't know 
it seemed like in a month or less. I don't know. Yeah. I just see it went by really fast. And then, um, yeah, we put that out and hit the road and then like right into, cause everybody was so burnt out because you know, you develop, uh, all kinds of, uh, habits and ticks when you yeah. play shows every day for a whole year. Yeah. Things aren't the same. And so everybody was like, you know, like, and then, you know, you don't just living off of $10 a day, $10 per diem. Our thing was tomorrow's per, can I get per, tomorrow's per diem today, sir? You know, and you're just asking yourself, like, basically, you know, yeah. and just like, it, it was wild, dude. Um, but yeah, so we did that. But then uh, when we hit the road for the second record, like, shit was crazy. And, you know, me and Corey got in the, you know, I don't know if you, the, you know, the fight. And then it happens. he's like, fuck you. And I'm like, fuck you. And he's like, I quit in the band. He joined Reggie. And we went home with our tails behind, behind, uh, tucked between our legs. Like, what do we do now? You know, like, fuck. And then, um, this is all like very, I'm going rapid fire here. There was a right. lot more, but yeah. Then Marshall's like hooked up with Wes Borland of black light burns. And yeah. he left the band and then me and Eric and Anthony are like, we got some other homies, you know, shout out Jamaki, Ben, John, other homies stepped up to, so we could keep touring. Adam Mitchell came back into the fold we toured Canada for the first time. Uh, Johnny, keep it together. Um, I think we're our last tour we we're doing was with um, those Caven dudes uh, or Adams. Uh, Adam McGrath from Caven had the band Clouds. Okay. And I won't ever forget this. I, yeah. So, you know, this tour is going cool. It's fun. It's fine. And we, uh, I remember sitting in the van with Anthony and Eric, and they're just. I mean, the, you know, the shows were okay, but it, like without your boys, like the OG dudes, you know, that's what they're, and then I just looked at the guys. I'm like, what's up, man? Like, I don't want to make you do anything you don't want to do. And it's just like, dude, it feels like, it feels like we're like in a cover band of our own band. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, I was like, you guys just want to go home? And they're like, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, Called the booking agent and I'm like, hey man, there's like a couple more shows left, but we're we're over it. We're going home. Like I think I think we're fucking done, you know? Like it's just yeah. this is this is just not what we signed up for. And we tried to honor our commitments and keep it going and but you know, you can't fake the funk. I mean, not right. to say that those those shows were great. It just you know, there's just wasn't of, the same. Yeah. So yeah, then I was like but I, I put so much of my everything like everything it didn't matter man relationships money time like i like that's all i wanted to do is keep that thing alive and do that and when that when i finally accepted that that's like not a thing i kind of was like oh shit dude i'm gonna like maybe i don't even maybe i don't want to do this anymore you know like i, I don't want to like that was just like traumatic like and yeah. it was crazy and so yeah i went home and we all went home and then uh, I and just then he like started laid the off. greatest DJ night to oh, ever no. be around. <laughs> no way. So, yeah. So that, so, then you came home and you started my favorite thing to go to in Lawrence ever. No, 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 no. I guess you were already doing that, right? Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. If it wasn't for, uh, I mean, if it wasn't for, so, Neon Dance Party is also something right about the time that. I joined the esoteric. You would have been doing that, right? right? About that like, yeah. time. So that's a whole other conversation. Maybe yeah, because I guess maybe I would have... change my glasses for this one. So, you know, I've noticed all the glasses on this show, and I yeah. really dig it. So I wanted to, like, be able to, like, join the sunglasses club. Oh. I don't have them on. I usually have Lokes on. Tight real quick. Uh, hopefully we'll get to it. But if not, like, uh, heels. Yeah, well, Stevie's got a new band that rules. It's straight up just... It's fucking... It's just straight up rock and roll, and it's like it's called Heels, and uh, a lot of people don't get it. I love it because I totally get what it's about, which is like a heel. If you don't know, in the pro wrestling world, is the I'm bad flats, guy. Bro. So it's like they do this. It's a it's a thing, and you got to see it. The music's great. It's the whole band is full of just straight up killers, just murderers. In the game, the People boys, are, the boys, they just they so just yeah. Rule. We're finishing our our first record, 
which we already have the second record and it's like really, really old stuff. But there's a hot little track on there we got called Sunglasses. Nice. I think you're really going to dig. Are and look at, making... these, look at these little specs I brought. Oh, these are Summer Slams. Yeah, dude. OG Summer Slams. Dude, are you going to make heel shades? It just might. You need to. Yeah. That should be the new merch. I should have worn my heel but shirt. It's also, upstairs. He's got neon on him. So let's yeah. let's do a little neon real quick. Let's do that's, a little neon. Let's that's do. important. So right about the time we did, uh, you know, I was joining up with the esoteric and living this, you know, whatever bohemian nightmare uh, in Lawrence or whatever. Um, I was working at Yellow Sub. I worked at Yellow Sub as well, and I uh, was working with a bunch of cool cats. But in one of those cool cats was a man named edwin morales also known as dj concept shout out my brother uh we were working at yellow sub and there was like i don't know there were like three different steves there was like you know and there was our and there was like another steven and that's where uh stevie really caught on because it was like you know, it's like, okay, I'll be Stevie. Fine, I'm Stevie. Yeah. Stevie Cruz. All right, let's do that. Whatever. And I remember Edwin would give me shit about that all the time. I can't remember what your deal was with that brother, but he, he was, he'd always make real good fun of me. And, uh, but we became tight bros. And like I said, like, so all during this time in Lawrence, I am just like, well, A, like, I, I, I like got that tick for my dad where I was like just a record fiend. Uh, and that never stopped. So I like, finally had my own place and it was just like a you know what do you call it like a one room apartment studio apartment um and it was just filled it was just a little box like this floor to ceiling records right you know like that was all i cared about and edwin came over one day shoot the breeze or whatever and he was just like holy fuck cruise like going through my records and just like dude like you should, because Edwin was already DJ and he was like right. in the jungle and techno and, you know, he was him and his girl at the time, uh, shout out Allison. And like, they were throwing parties like in KC, like raves and stuff and Lawrence and Kansas City and like this whole other world I didn't really know about. And then he was like, yo, I'm thinking about starting this eighties night and you should do it with me. And I was like, man, what the fuck? I'm not going to be a DJ. He's like, oh dude, why not? And I'm like, oh, silly. Like, yeah. he's like, all you do is hang out and play records. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you have all the records. Like, I mean, I had hella 80s, you yeah. know, pop, new wave. You goth, had all the records. Goth, so industrial. That's what happens with dudes that have lots of records. Either they're super introverted and they just sit at home yeah, and nobody that- ever knows they have records or they become DJs. Yeah. And he was like, I'll show you, you know, I'll show you the ropes, you know. And I'm like, okay, cool, you know, eventually. And then, um, so it was Coco Locos, which is, uh, I don't even know what it is now, but a lot of people remember the jackpot that was across the street from Replay. Yeah. That was called Coco Locos, owned by Kelfel. Uh, and bless his heart, Kelfel gave us the opportunity to start uh, a DJ night, you know, after his restaurant closed, whatever. And um, it was just a few of us, like, hey, we're going to have an 80s. And this is before everybody was a DJ. And there was no digital DJ, and, and there were CDs. Um, but really, it was still, like, all about vinyl. Right. Because, like, yeah. CD players were really expensive. And, um, and CDs were expensive. Yeah. So, and old records and were you, cheap and you had to have it, you know, or else there was no party. So, uh, we started playing there and then, uh, it really just started building the momentum really fast. I think he changed it to like a tapas bar kind of read. I forget. He changed the name. And I mean, within the first year, maybe even a few months, like we were like one in one out type shit. It was every single Thursday night. Yeah. Right. And so that's where it started. And that was just like, what? Like I was still working like regular jobs and now I'm getting paid like hundreds of dollars and you know, more yeah, almost your whole paycheck night. to fucking to just do get one drunk night. and play records with my friend. I'm yeah. like hot babes everywhere. Like I'm like, what the hell? This what? This is like the best thing ever. And everybody else felt the same way. They're like, this is the best night ever. And there was just that energy of like, this is so much fun. Yeah. And and it was like, and all of a sudden, you know, and it was like before it was like, hey, we're we're open-minded or, you know, we're, we're not, you know, we're specifically this kind of, or that, like, uh, like we immediately had that vibe of like, everybody's welcome. 
Yeah, none of that freaks. shit mattered to any of us right. back then. It was just freaks. It was just freaks. Yeah. yeah. And and whatever, dude. Chad's and Stacy's, goth kids. Nobody, yeah, everybody like, was cool. Metal, that night metal was heads. Like, like dude, that because it, it was like all, the punk the rock scene during that time, and, like, and Lawrence was insane, right? So all the B boys were there, B boys, B girls. There, you know, the, I mean, there would just be pockets, man. It was insane. So that built insane every Thursday night. Sold that place out. We moved to the bottleneck. Yep. Sold that out every Thursday for X amount of years. Um. Yeah. So somewhere during that time, I started touring with Esoteric and. Thank God, everybody who supported Neon, because you, I had, you know, I'm on the road making basically ten dollars a day. Right. And uh, luckily, and Edwin, like we were just real tight, and he would send me my cut if I wasn't there. And then when he started traveling and and moved, I would do the same for him, and like that kept me, you know, afloat. Uh, yeah. even when I wasn't there because it became such an institution. And so I'm so grateful and it was just fucking fun as hell. Dude. But yeah, sold out the bottleneck every night. I mean, it, it was known as an 80s night, but really we played uh, modern stuff, you know. Like, yeah, it was just like... but It was heavy on the 80s, yeah. but, but various 80s, you know. It could, you know. Um, and then we moved, then we, you know... The big it? league. And we went to the Granada... I did not want to go to the Granada. I said, Edwin Ellison, we got a good thing going. Why do we have to go to the Granada? They're like, think bigger, think better. And I was like, ah. But we moved to the Granada. Yeah. I don't know why I just did Trump, but. It was good, though. We went. And we start, We did sell the Granada every Thursday for quite a while. Yeah. But that room's so big that eventually. eventually yeah, there's nowhere and to go with that. more and more people started having Dance nights, nights and DJs yeah, yeah, nights, yeah. so there was more competition, and uh, and I was torn more, and so I couldn't be as present. Um, and then I believe Edwin moved Edwin to Chicago, and that's where we got Iggy Baby. Shout out uh, Tito Fuego. Uh, so we met. That's where we met Iggy. So Neon Dance Party could have a whole, really should have its own episode. Yeah, as yeah. Well, yeah. I will tell but, you, I, the craziest night I ever had in Lawrence, Kansas was after one of the neons at um, the Granada. And I went out front, and there was some Chad with a Mercedes Benz, and he, like, blew his horn at me, and I ripped the side mirror off. I just I just muscled the mirror off Fuck this car. Yeah. Then I ran up and over the top of another car. We went to a party, <laughs> and I was carrying that Mercedes mirror around with me. <laughs> <laughs> and then some guy tried to fight me, and I just started spinning the mirror around. I, I th- I've, fr- I've been kicked out of every house party I ever went you to. You weren't the guy that got kicked. Whoa, were you talking about getting get kicked out of the bottleneck? Oh, I've I would n- I've never been kicked out okay. of the bottleneck. Okay, because I worked right, right. Because right, when I worked right, for right, Jeff, like right, right. dude, when I was like 15, 16, 17, I was like a, like a greaser. You know, I was like right. way into rockabilly and shit and punk rock. But like when I'm working there, and it's like holy shit, that's the guy from wait. It's like, you're the dude from Split Lip Rayfield. And it's like, these all, I was like very clueless and oblivious back then to like when I was in high school and out there hanging out with my sister and her friends. Most like, deaf. There was like, you know. There's a lot going on. It's where I really first learned like only because I didn't know uh, to like just, I just treated everybody the same. But it's like, you know. When uh, there was like, how many famous bands were there at that time in like the early 2000s that in Lawrence, like people would move there from other places. And like, well, so and then, there's like all these people that were always around. And then I like, I'm around all these people who yeah. are like famous touring musicians. And I'm just like, okay, well, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm like 16, dude. I'm just going to be over here. No, I don't want any drugs, sir. I'm 100%. just going to, I'm just going to keep putting this together. Cause I was like real stingy. I didn't do drugs or drink really. I drank a little. I learned, well, the guy from Split Lip Rayfield was like, my sister would get kicked out of the bar all the time when we'd go to shows. And I'd be in there like 15, 16 years old. And she, they'd be kicking her out. And she's like, my fucking brother's over there. He's younger than me. And they're like, yeah, your brother doesn't have a fucking PBR in his hand, though. But I'd have like a rum and Coke. But it'd be like, that much rum. Like, they were always, in hindsight, I, I realized like, 
there was a lot, I was at least surrounded by people that like let me experience things, but they also it was keeping in a, a controlled environment. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because I like yeah, they were keeping a good eye on me. Man, and could, I'm sure could, that was because of that. you. You know, like Jeff. Like yeah. again, that's all, all back to Jeff. Oh, but, Jeffy boy. But yeah, that neon that was like that was wild, dude. It's wild, and to be a part of like. I mean, I, I ran for like almost a day. De- I mean, I ran for like at least eight years. Yeah. And, and every Thursday I, night, because I was able, once it moved to the bottleneck. Yeah. It was 18 and up. Right. And I was already, I think I was 18 then, but I would have been able to go to that anyways, just because oh, right. I knew everyone. Yeah, like yeah, I used to be able to, there was a few places I could go under age and like be cool, you know? Um, but dude, I, I experienced so much cool shit. Like, Rollins spit in my sister's face one time, which just made me like Henry Rollins. You know what I mean? Like, I got to hang out with the Misfits while they put their makeup on. Like, albeit it was with Michael Graves, but I fucking love those records. I don't care what all those old people say. Like, they're crazy. Like, those are good records. I'm a Glenn man. I'm a I know Glenn you can, man. I'm strictly dancing, fine, bro. But I, I, I like That's all cool. of it. I like yeah. it all. And to like be able to like. I got to hang out with Jerry only and Doyle. You know what I mean? Like I've told the story a bunch of times. Like the, I went to see them first, like after on the second American psycho tour, they toured like in between the two records and they were with Guar and we didn't have enough tickets. And Dave Brocky was out front with Dr. Chud and they put me on the guest list. Hi. They sold our tickets that we had, gave me the money and I went and bought a bunch of shirts wasn't until I was inside one of the old punk rock dudes I knew was there and he was like, That's the guy from Guar, dude. And I'm like, I had no idea. But it just Sweet made dudes. me like that yeah. like it made like that did something to me at fifteen years old where it was like, Oh, if you just do good shit for people, like you same feeling you had, like whatever that dude felt and the way I felt from them like solving a problem for us and like being so cool to recognize that here's a young kid who's bummed, who's not going to be able to see the show because his ride oh, can't yeah. get in. Like, let me fix that. And it, like, made me, like, later on to be like, oh, well, you can do that for other oh, people. Oh, yeah, you know 100%. I mean? Yeah, that was, it was like, you know, brotherhood, very cool vibes. I remember, yeah, being led into shows like that. Oh, my bad. Yeah, no, just, yeah. just make sure everybody gets keep real it, antsy on keep, the audio keep quality. Keep it pro. Keep it pro. Okay. But I yeah, brought, so, I brought you this little guy right here. Oh shit! Check out that bad man, Majama dude. So nice. That's, is that a Chevrolet? That yeah. is a Chevrolet. Yeah, it's a Chevy four by four. She's going right on the set. Oh yeah, let's crank her up. Yeah, crank her up there, dude. Fuck yeah! Thank you. Things here, my Cruiser friend. and I also sp- did a, a, a tour of duty in the Westport area while he was Woo! DJing at the Union, and I was busting heads. But Stevie and I also, there was a crew of us that used to go hang out at, uh, fuck, what was the name of that uh, late night restaurant in uh, City Market? Whoa, dude. That we used to go, uh, was it Ray, what was the name of that place? Was it Ray J's? No. Brought you a couple muscles. What the couple, fuck? A couple muscles, dude. You don't couple remember muscles? muscles? It's probably, oh, I remember those. It's probably before your time, kid. No, those aren't. <laughs> I remember those. I was poor. Yeah, I was still yeah, buying were, the. I was oh, still yeah. buying the non-posable figures as Most a kid. Most stuff, dude. Mono Miggies. Um. Uh, dude, a diner in in City Market. Yeah, what was that? Not in City Market in uh the Arts District in the Crossroads. What was that weird? It was next oh, to that. Bro. Who was that famous lady? Oh, that, YJ's. YJ's. Oh, yeah, hell yeah. yeah. We used to okay. go to YJ's. Josh okay. Allen used to go dude, with us. YJ's is the institution, Fucking, man. Uh, old Lucas was there. Oh. The whole union crew. Oh, Lukey. Man, I need to see Lucas. I haven't seen him in a hot minute. Yeah. Uh, I love that dude. I've but yeah, seen him, him and I time. and Chris Ray, we, we were rolling hard. Do you remember Chris Ray? Oh, yeah. The other I big tall Chris boy? Yeah, yeah, He's still yeah, one yeah, of my yeah. best friends. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he lives in Olathe, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah, still yeah, around. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because um, yeah, Chris opened that restaurant up out back of the union. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, it was short-lived, but yeah. Dude, everyone was there. Keenan, Dan, oh, yeah. uh, Norcross. Norcross, w- Norcross went to Wichita with us. Did he? Yeah. yeah. Oh fuck, uh, dude. Yeah, that's Marty the, Bush was there. That's where I met Bush. Marty Bush. Was the union? Yeah. Well, so, I, me and Marty have been knowing each other for you know way back in those Lawrence days, like yeah. what I was talking about. And, and that's what him and I assume that at some point we cross paths out there. We just don't know it. You know what I mean? Like, right. It's kind of a blur. 
Well, dude, again, we're all, I'm oblivious when I some of those, and I was younger, so like, you know, it it was mostly like old, much older people that would like give me the time of day. You know what I mean? Anybody that was like right in their early twenties, I was just sort of like, oh, this is this, this fucking get that's this Amanda's kid, little this, brother. Get this kid out of get here. Get this kid out of here. Um, yeah, dude, YJ's. God, what a great place. God, I miss that place. That place. Every time ruled. I drive by, I'm like. I wish it was a thing. Yeah, man. I love YJ's. I it mean, great. that's another complete institution and I'm gonna, sorely I mean, missed. Video oh, dude, we haven't even been recording this whole time. Oh, I am, but we've only got 35 minutes left on the Oh, show. shit, dude. Oh, shit, dude. As I already said, I mean, we've been going for a fucking... Like yeah, a, I'll ramble an hour. on, dude. Oh, yeah, dude. But... Stevie also brought us a Hammerlord record. I did, I did. So, which uh, was the metal band? Yeah. So this band formed uh, after after the, after Esoteric, uh, but includes the uh, Reason to Breathe drummer Adam Mitchell, Terry Taylor, Terry Taylor Ty from Thirteen Thirteen Mockingbird Lane. Indeed, Go to indeed. Lawrence so, yeah. Toys. Shout out one of the best uh, toy stores. Uh, around now was Terry into toys back then already? Oh yeah, dude. Terry, you were already into toys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we've been nerds since we were born, right? Um, but I, yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. Amongst other things, but yeah. So uh, and then JP gone, Ty Scott. Um, love this band, and you know, hopefully one day we'll play a show again. I still uh, hold on to that dream because that was a blast. Yeah, but yeah. This is the last record we put out. That we didn't really get to play any shows on. Double LP, if you would like a copy, you could go to hammerlord.org and buy one, and I will send it to you. Yeah, because you still keep it all alive yeah. uh, with the merch and everything. Because you, you, yeah. yeah, you might as well. You got it. You well, might yeah, as well. I mean, I thought maybe we were going to, well, like with anything. One man, day it will. With, with bands, no matter what, like bands will, you know, like, especially at the age, you know, I'm at. And, but I think even when I was younger, I thought that way too. It's like, when you make a recording or like a film or, you know, of course there's a lot of reasons you do it, but like at the end of the day, it's just this really sweet document of your time together and this like portrait of whoever's involved, like at that time. And that, that's important, but it rips. I just think it's so good. Yeah. Like, it does rip. I never, yeah. I mean, the band ripped. It's a, yeah. And you guys used to play. So it's like more of like a thrash metal shows, type like... thing. Yeah. We dude, we slayed hard, you know, it was a brief, moment but uh yeah it was real good times and everybody's still around so you never know hammerlord reunion 20 but yeah like so i sunk my uh, a good chunk of my savings into the these vinyl right uh, like 2019 you know? yeah oh yeah because right. that's right and is that what really what kind of killed it was covid well there were uh, there's some other factors you know we don't have to get into at the moment but yeah but the definitely covid did not help right and that but that's kind of how heels happen right is because yeah, cause didn't terry become like a nurse at at the beginning of COVID or something. Yeah, like but that? Terry's always down to play. It ain't no, Terry. I know, but then it was Terry, like, Terry's but like Terry me. quickly T- went Terry. from being nurse to being like, nah, fuck this, I'm gonna own a toy store. No, dude, he's he's still doing nursing. Is he still nursing? Yeah, dude. Oh, Terry, I thought they just did the toy store. No, dude, Terry's a maniac, dude. He's like me, like he doesn't stop. Like he, yeah. he, Terry Taylor, shout out my friend. I mean, he he will work and play. Well, you know, Nico his last did that. Herman Munster that's on the outside of the front. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Nico painted that nice. out there when Terry first opened. I haven't seen the uh, new extension. I haven't been out there in, in a long time. Space. I don't go to Lawrence a lot anymore, dude. We should just it, do a Lawrence day trip, dude. We might need to. It. Um, I still play a replay lounge patio once a month. Yeah. As a DJ. Uh, I just... Um, it's but so... I love that store. I'm glad I'm a vintage toy I'm glad guy. that the bottleneck is still there yep. and I'm glad the replay is still there and yeah. I'm glad the granada is still there because those are yeah. like the last three remnants to me of what cuz there's so what like it's just so different and it's become like anything they took I I'm watching as like people are screaming about culture but they're erasing it all you know what i mean ah, like you know indeed. what i mean like people like talk a lot of shit and then they they whitewash everything with like everything the walls are all painted white and it's all unfinished natural wood inside and it's like dude where's that what happened to seventh heaven like 
Remember yeah. where we used to go buy spikes for our jackets and like heavy metal mm. patches and bongs and like, and then it's like, wait, what happened to that one place? And like, where's the people, where are the hippies at? And like, it's like, it's, it, well, you're it, not, same thing's happening right, here. Right. Like same thing's happening on Strawberry Hill right now. Like I'm watching that place become something what different. about the west bottoms man a, a same we talked about that it's totally different than when i started hanging out with the car club in 2003 2004 i guess well i was already down there because we were street racing it would have been 2006 when i joined the car club i think 2007 right. and then like being down there then there was like hookers and like truckers and like dead bodies and gang members and wild shit. And then slowly but surely we watched as it's like, now you go down there and it's like, like somebody sent me a video one day and they're like made like those lofts that are down there. They had like a fucking commercial for them. And I'm in the commercial driving my old orange Chevy van through the bottoms. And I'm like, Part of me wanted better to better like, send hey. some fucking royalties. Yeah, it's like, hey, can you take me out of this? Because this is like everything I, I don't I represent. I didn't sign up for this. I, I don't represent. Hey, look, it's a cool actual Kansas City guy. Yeah. Get him in there. Get him in there. People will think if you live here, you, you'll see shit you like this. You could be as cool as Tyler. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. It's it's wild. So. Uh, You're still there? You, you got the union library? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, we're still doing uh, doing the thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, so Cyan, my, the love of my life, my partner in crime, my ride or die, uh, which she'd be a good interview. Yeah. I need to get Cyan over here too. Jeez Louise. Also Mm. known Cyan since back in, I don't even, again, it's one of those things where I don't know how it's the same with me. Yeah. It's like, it's been so long. I don't know how long it's been. You know what I mean? It feels like. Our entire adult lives, we've all known each other. You yeah, know? it's wild. So we've been doing, and and not and not just uh, not just her and I, but you know, I mean, it's been, I mean, Marty Bush and the Hyborian dudes right. were up in there for a long time. Uh, it's now the home of heels. Britt Adair, yeah, God bless her soul. I miss her so much. Uh, Britt was, uh, you know, bad ideas. Steve Gardell's. Uh, right now, John Brazook still up there doing some stuff with us, obviously heels. I mean, it's, I, there's so many. And then, I mean, these are just people that have helped, you know, like be up there, pay the rent and, and make and build and, and, and whatnot. But then the coolest thing about union library is, is, you know, it's not about any of us specifically, or even the people who are there more often than not, but everybody that comes together to do an event or a party or an exhibition or, whatever you know it's yeah. like so vast and um and different like pockets and sex of the city and and different you know totally i i love the place and the place is alive like it's got its own like that building is like alive it's like, just like it's culture got incubator. its own thing yeah 100 yeah, percent. so still trying to i mean we're still that yeah, completely doing what we do there, um, which is, you know, hard to explain because it's always different and the place is always changing. Yeah, it could be you do um, Dr. Sketchies. You Dr. Do- Sketchies every first Sunday is uh, one of the few regular things. Speaking of Cy, uh, we are relaunching. Do you remember Cyan when her and Liz used to do uh, Black and Blue Mondays oh, at yeah. Karma? And it was yeah. two for one anythings. And she, you know, it, she's heavy on like the goth industrial and yeah, yeah, dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then all the other weirdo B-side oddity stuff that, you know, Cyan will play for four or five hours, you know. So was, that's what it was. is two for one anything, Liz behind the bar, Cy just being Cyan. And that was a crazy institution. Like that was like every Monday night and that was packed out and insane. Um, yeah. I didn't know her then, you know, per se. I mean, I've, I've been obsessed with her since you know, the moment I saw her. But, yeah. uh, but I did attend a couple times throughout the year, like when I wasn't on tour or something. And, um, that was crazy. So we are relaunching a new version, but keep calling it black and blue this this Thursday. I don't know when this comes out, but, uh, whatever the, this coming Thursday we're doing, uh, black and blue. Liz is going to be behind the bar. Obviously, uh, Cyan's DJ and I'm going to play some tunes. Uh, shout out our girl, Jenny Severo, 
is also DJing and she was a big motivator of like, we got to do a goth night. You know, it was just kind of obsessing on yeah, some hasn't dark been a stuff. Goth night in a long time. Yeah. I mean, when there's, about. it's there's kind of been scattered and I think then Rico does Rico, one. Rico, dance Rico thing. and, and, and Tulipana have, and, um, uh, the revisor guys and Monta guys are like kind of trying to, uh, or I think they have been doing something on the regular, yeah. I think, but like a Sunday. So, but it's going to be like, uh, usually like kind of the la- third, It'll be every third Thursday is what we're shooting for. Sick. Next month, it'll be the fourth Thursday because uh, that's just how that is. But yeah, and it's just, it's you know, it'll be very uh, on the goth, industrial, dark wave, like those type of vibes. So we're going to be doing that as a pseudo regular thing up there as well. But other friends have monthlies that happen up there, you know, um, and I could go on. Yeah, and then Kimmin's got a thing. Kim, that- Kimmin's coming up. So yeah, Fri- that's this Friday's Fish and Bingo. Yeah. You got to come up, check that out. That's going to be fun. I will also be DJing that and Father yeah. Father Lupin and the Demons are playing. Yeah, Jory's band. Yeah, yeah. Really and like- Jacqueline. And I like all- Jory a lot. <laughs> I love Jory, dude. <laughs> He's such an asshole. Yeah, that's Bo. what I like about him. <laughs> oh, dude. Nothing better than a good asshole. Yeah. I mean, that was the whole kind of... In the best kind of way, like that was he the whole- is. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know... Kind of basis of heels. And there's something interesting about a hardcore Jewish dude, like a for real Jewish dude that plays country music. That just is oh, like, dude. how does this happen? I'm a big <laughs> big fan of Father Lupin. Yeah. And them damn demons. Yeah, so that that's uh that's this Friday. Um or, you know, I don't know that that might sound weird whenever this comes out. But yeah, I mean, all kinds of cool shit going on up there. And I'm so thankful for the spot and everyone that's been that's put their time and energy and everything into it. Cause like, man, that's, it's a special space. And with all the new development and all the shifting of the shit that's going on down there, um, we're, we're there and we're going to stay there as long as we can, you know, and the powers that be and the powers that should not be are in the know and we'll see what happens, you know? Hoping for the best, expecting the worst. I think you're good. They people. It's we're in an age of understanding. I think where people are we. (laughs) We're in an age of understanding. Well, I think where people recognize that, like, you have to. And there's examples. You like the three examples I brought up in Lawrence. Why is it that we don't have anything like that here? Well, what you know? I love this show. I love Black Magic TV. Big fan. And one thing that gets brought up a lot was the institution that we did have, right? which was Riot Room. That we which lost. Is, oddly enough, right. we haven't talked about Riot Room too much. We which, haven't talked about it, it at all. It does happen a lot. Yeah. I mean, that was definitely a home of mine for sure. Shout out to the uh, Gooches and- um, The slow learners from Turner. Shit. Oh. Yeah. Did you take the brown acid at the White Snake concert? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we don't have that. Like, we don't have a replay. And then the hurricane before that. Like, and then the hurricane. There, I know a lot of and dudes are the like, Beaumont, that, like, it's crazy to me that there's an entire generation now that they never got to go. Right. They never got to go watch um, social distortion at the Boma and then watch idiots try to ride that bull afterwards. <laughs> the bull. Remember it too? That oh, was yeah. like hundred percent. The weirdest thing that there's this shit kicker bar in the middle of the city. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then when they had those country nights, dude, and all the, all the cowboys and cowgirls would be like Westport. Cause takeover, we have, we but... have bars. Yeah. Like the 403 has been yeah, become a yeah. pretty I mean, big deal. There's bars that are I love the around. 403. Shout out. Artie. Um, but like, I, look, Davies is gone. Yeah. It's wild, dude. I mean, things, you know, it's ebbs and flows and things change, but yeah, it is, it is important to, uh, I mean, that's the other thing I've learned too, is you got to make each moment the, right. make the most because right. you never know. It could be your last. It and could like, be the that's last. Yeah. Like, you know, and that's with also, I mean, definitely with your friends and, uh, and with places, you know, with buildings and with, you know, spots. Um, yeah. But yeah. So I guess I'm just jealous of Lawrence. That's the one thing I'm jealous about from Lawrence is that they, it's like, I can still go to the bottleneck and it, I'm able to go back in time and like, you know what I mean? I can I I I, I think about all those cool things I saw there and got yeah. the experience. You know? Oh I mean? man, yeah. You walk into these places and there's just instant memories. Even like, the Granada, like yeah. sitting there, like, uh, uh, what was that? Was it the urge? 
That was Probably. from fucking Topeka. Where was, is that the band from Topeka? Or was it Urge Overkill? No, it was no, the Urge. Urge Overkill and the Urge were two different bands. Right. Uh, Urge Overkill were the band that was like, uh, had the Pulp Fiction hit or. Right. You'll be a woman. It's too. not that band. It's. It no, it was, was like a cover, right? And then the was, urge was like a like a scoff yeah, thing urge, or something. Yeah, the urge definitely. The guy from the urge used to I hang out, out at the Granada not all the time. I'm I'm Scott's on its way back, and I can't be more fucking excited about it. Go go boy! I, I'm ready. Hey, to I'm go not see, hating. I just I'm miss, ready to go I just, see real big I mean, fish. I was or, around, but it, I'm, I'm waiting for that save Ferris reunion. So speaking of Wichita, oh Phil, I remember yeah. those guys were like a big deal. Yeah, in yeah, that yeah. Realm. Ruska Bank was from. Uh, <laughs> they were a pretty big ska band. They were from all kids that went to K State. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm down. And you can catch me uh, when I throw the Ska Festival at the Union Line. Dude! <laughs> Ska Fest Actually, 2024, we do have to talk, dude. I do have something to talk to you about. Let's do it, man. But, uh, Let's do it. This is a great time, I think, to... We're, we're at a stopping point, and Stevie and I talked, but, like, definitely, like, we can't cover all of this. Yeah, and this is Stevie will a, be back on more than one time. Was, uh, we still have so much to talk about. This we is have, just a primer. Yeah, we have the Riot Room. We can go deeper into dude, Hammerlord. We need to talk we, about pro wrestling. And your, oh my god! I can't your, believe, we oh didn't even god. really talk about you know uh, the pro wrestling announcing you used to do and like. Well, we could just talk about wrestling. We could just talk about wrestling hour. for. I would yeah, love we that. could talk about wrestling for a whole hour. Because um, that's my chessboard, man. That's my everything. But guys, if you want to support Stevie, buy Hammerlord Records. You could, yeah, you could go well, to events at the you, Union you Library. Check out heels. Check out Heels, right. We don't play all too often. Uh, we are playing Union Library with the Whiffs on a Tuesday, like the last oh, yeah, I'll Tuesday be, I'll in be down May. For that. The Whiffs and the Heels. I mean, you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, like in, you like never that. know. This is a volatile band and we might just, it might be it, you know. But I, uh, I am mixing, doing, finalizing the yeah, mix. Keep, keep the work with up Paul with Malin the volatile band. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. And uh, so if that's nothing sick. else, so there will be a sweet record uh, here shortly. So that'll be coming out soon. Well, dog, I fucking love you. I love you, bro. I'm so glad. Thanks I, for I having me. You. This is yeah. awesome, dude. This is great. I finally, I'm here. I feel like I'm in the TV. You are. I'm in we the TV. We are in the TV or your cell phone. Guys, thanks for watching. Remember yeah. Shocker? We'll see you next time. From wrestling? No, the movie. Oh, I thought you meant like the... Going in. <laughs> <laughs>